Okay, thank you. Nice to have you on the show. Um, thanks for doing publicity on your kind of half day off. What would you normally be doing if you were wandering around the streets of Melbourne today? What would you like to be doing? You know, honestly, I would be in my room watching cricket. Do you, do you like cricket? <laughs> yeah. I did not I'm a base, know this. I'm a baseball guy. I'm a baseball guy, yeah. so it's an easy translation. <laughs> Although it goes forever compared to baseball. There's well, no... so, so does love, but that doesn't keep us from it, does it? <laughs> That's fantastic, Billy. Um, now, um, I got people to text in prior to talking to you to say... Um, how your gig was yesterday at Soundwave, uh, in fact, over the weekend. And Kathy Beale on Twitter has said it was the best lineup you've ever had. How does that make you feel? Oh, that's very kind. Yeah. Um, you know, we have Mark from The Killers on bass and uh, Brad Wilk from Rage Against the Machine and Audio Slave on drums. So it's a great lineup. And uh, Jeff, who's been with the band for uh, since 2006. So um, very, very strong musicians. Yeah, that's good. And now Tommy Lee, who played on the album, <laughs> he's not going to make a special guest appearance, is he? No, I think Tommy, actually, I just texted with Tommy the other day. He just got back from uh, Japan. With yeah. East, they're start doing the end of the crew tour. Ooh. And how is he? He's great. <laughs> he's, 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 he's in a good place. Uh, Tommy's, I, I don't know if you ever met Tommy. He's just a lovely person, you know. He's great, great fun to be around. And he's just, he's He's very enthusiastic about life, and that really translates when you're yeah. around him. It was an unexpected pairing, though, to have him turn up on your album. How did that all come about? How do you end up with someone from a band like his touring with you? Well, not well, not touring, but recording with you. Uh, we were working on a song, and we, I jokingly said, uh, half-jokingly said, we need someone who plays like Tommy for the song. <laughs> and Jeff uh, Schroeder said, uh, why don't we get the real Tommy Lee? And it was like that kind of flash of lightning, like, when I was like, oh, my God, how crazy would that be? And then I was on the phone with him probably within the next 24 hours and flew to L.A. and played him the songs, and it was like, dude, I'm into it. And it was like, <laughs> lightning, yeah. And the, and the gods and the gods never forgave us. Oh, know? goodness me. Well, he is an enthusiastic chap. I think I remember when I was reading the, the, the biography of the band and um, and when he met Pamela Anderson at the time, when he met her, he didn't even speak to her. He just went up and licked her face Did because he? <laughs> he liked her so much. He's obviously quite honest with his emotions. He's never licked me, <laughs> um, but he gives a good hug. <laughs> That's fantastic. Coming back to Australia, I know Australia holds some um, kind of special memories and also some strange ones, which you alluded to on your website. What What's that? What was that all about? Uh, well, you know, I was in a relationship with an Aussie lass. So, um, and, you know, there's a point in my life where I was going to maybe live here part time. Yeah. So it's a little bit bittersweet in that regard. Um, I think, you know, we all know what that feels like. You know, you turn down a certain road and it's like, oh, that's where we used to go shop or something, you know. So uh, it's hard for me that way, but it's it's all good. I love the country, you know, beautiful people. And, and it's nice because I've been coming here for about 20 years now. Yeah. And, and just to see the improvement in the country, uh, the spirit of the country. Uh, it's one of the best places in the world. And I can't tell how many people tell me how they would love to live here, considering the, the condition of America. Uh, and kind of what's going on politically what, what and socially. You, what, do see, what do you see as the condition of America? What do you feel is, is going on? Because I know you, you've, you've expressed quite a few of these views, particularly in terms of music. Where do you see America at the moment? Well, we have a kind of uh, personality, cult-driven political system, uh, which is uh, most emphasised by the president, who's sort of using his, the power of his celebrity to push things through which are literally against the law. Um, even he, uh, in, he, we have an issue going on right now with immigration, which is a highly contentious issue. Uh, and I, you know, I come from immigrant class. Uh, you know, all three branches of my family, because uh, there was one through divorce, uh, uh, all immigrant class. So I, I'm really sensitive to these issues. And uh, uh, Chicago is uh, has a huge uh, uh, Mexican American population. And Chicago is where you live for those. Who yeah, don't I'm just know. Yeah. and born born and raised. So. You know, uh, really understand the the way uh, immigrants uh, can can contribute to a culture and make a culture better. But we have, you know, there's a lot of people I know who can't even get into America who come from countries that um, they're not going to say walk over a border. So we, we have these very contentious issues. It's a big political issue, and even the president had come out many times and said, "I can't do uh, what he's now done." which is granting some de facto amnesty to millions of people, and there, it's a highly, highly charged atmosphere. Um, and that's just one facet. There's all sorts of other facets. So 
uh, we're, maybe the best way to explain it without going into a bunch of nuances is the social media era has ushered in a kind of different type of power mm. where, you know, the way people respond on Twitter or Facebook can literally change political agendas not in a good way. Can I can uh, I ask you how that's affected you as an artist, as a musician? How has this whole celebrity-driven culture and, and social media-driven culture affected how you create personally then? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. I'd like to tackle it slightly differently before I answer your question. It, it, what happens is is uh, the, the, cult, the social media culture, in many ways, uh, rewards artists who have one message because they can, in essence, build on that message mm. like a repetitive echo. When you have a, ver a, a widely varied career like mine where, you, you know, I've made mistakes because I've just taken chances, it's hard to m amass that same sort of momentum. And, and stories kind of <coughs> double and triple over on each other. And, you know, for every person who likes my band, there's another person who can't stand my band because of something I said in 1992. And somebody trots out a quote from some magazine I don't even remember doing, you know. Um, so you're living with this kind of constant past future thing and mm. it, creatively the only way only thing you can really do is go back to a system of values which is I know what a good song is I know what good production is I believe in myself and my talent and ultimately uh, you can trust that the world will organize itself that maybe uh, you'll find the people who want to listen to you through the through the wires of the web in a way that's different than the old way which is they have to go into a record store and buy it or listen to a station yeah. Well, look, I'm really interested to keep talking to you about where you see how your music fits in into this particular time and place. Billy Corgan is my guest in the Double J Studios. Are you happy to hang around, Billy? Sure. We'll play another one of your songs. This one is One and All on Double J. Just album. That one is One and All. And Billy Corgan is live in the studio with me right now. Billy, you were talking earlier about how your band is kind of caught up in this past, present sort of space-time continuum. How does that affect you in terms of the way you make your music? Uh, well, I'd say going forward it doesn't. Uh, mm. But I have, I have tried to figure out a way to kind of balance all those things in the past few years, and I would say it hasn't really worked. But as an artistic uh, impetus, I think I've learned a lot in trying to do it. In essence, tackling the phantom of the Smashing Pumpkins has yeah. been valuably, valuable to me as an artist, even if it hasn't necessarily been valuable to people listening. You've been really outspoken recently, because um, I, I read quite a few recently? interviews over the weekend. <laughs> well, yeah, again, let's just say again. Uh, and when you've, been, um, you've been talking to the media about how they like to pigeonhole your band, and, and I wondered if you know if you ever regret being so honest because that seems to be a, a real kind of uh, it, it's like you're driven to be completely honest about how you're feeling about things at the moment has that been problematic for you or do you think do you feel like it makes you stronger oh no i think absolutely it's been problematic and i think it's affected the legacy of the band and i think it's affected the way people hear my music and i think if i kept my mouth shut like a, a good genius is supposed to i think <laughs> I'd, I'd be more highly regarded and i would have probably had a more successful career but, but you should be able to be honest well i agree with you but let me say it slightly differently i grew up very interested in the idea of what a performance artist is and for people who don't know what a performance artist is it's like uh, i used to see this uh, lady i would go to this club when i was like a kid like 18 years old and she would be in the middle of the club in like a uh, like a glass box and she would co be covered in chocolate oh. and you'd stand there and say why is this lady in the glass box covered in chocolate and what what you learn from performance artists is they go into spaces that make you uncomfortable to ask make you ask questions about yourselves and and one of the original concepts of the Smashing Pumpkins is that we, we approached our music like performance artists because we felt so much great music had preceded us that we could never supersede it. We were never thought we were going to be better than The Cure or Led Zeppelin or mm. The Beatles or whatever. So we thought we can we can find this other territory and kind of poke holes in the in the in the hypocrisy of music or what people think alternative is and stuff like that. And of course we went on to have a lot of success doing that and it really opened us up to a wide variety of music everything from a tonight tonight to you know a chair rock or something you know it's like very different types of music so if i just wanted to be a famous successful person i would say it would have been better to keep my mouth shut but as a performance artist as somebody who's asking questions and creating uh uncomfortable scenarios i think i've been very effective that way and i think at the end of the day i think that's more how i'm going to be judged more like an andy warhol type character in music 
than whether or not I sold enough records. Oh, okay. So I, I sort of didn't realise that performance artist aspect to it. So in terms of being, you're being honest, but it's 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 a it's a it's a kind of it's an art project as well. Are you testing us? Are you yes. testing us, Billy yeah. Corgan? Tell me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like uh, if anybody knows, like the great comedian Andy Kaufman, you know, yes. he would go into character and. And we would go into character. We would we would purposely do the exact opposite thing you're supposed to do, because we thought, well, this is all kind of silly. Why is everyone taking themselves so seriously? And then, of course, when it became a really big business, not just us, all the bands, um, you know, a lot of like you know, Nirvana was a great band, but a lot of times people missed the humor in Kurt's music. Mm, that's uh, true. A, a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, Courtney uh, t was turned into this kind of dramatic thing. But there's a lot of interesting wry witticism and, and humor in Courtney's music. That gets passed if you haven't read Baudelaire, you know. Um, we, we were all learned people who were coming at it from different ends and angles. The fact that it became big business in many ways was a result of our brilliance, not uh, because we were contrived. Yeah. Um, and when you're an individual and the world turns against you and says, oh, by the way, stop being an individual, get in your lane, be quiet, uh, get along. Uh, it's kind of strange because that's not, that's not the thing that brought you to the dance. Yeah. If that is the case, though, if you are uh, enacting a, 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 some sort of performance art piece in order to, I guess, cope with the pressures, who is the real Billy Corgan then? <laughs> the real William Corgan. Who is he? I'm just, I'm is just he a sitting nerd. at home with his cats? I'm a nerd, yeah. yeah. <laughs> two cats, two dogs. Tell me That's your cats' it. names and your dogs' names. Uh, Mr. Tom Aww. and Sammy are my cats' names. They're rescue cats. I recommend anybody, uh, if you want to get an animal, get rescue oh, animals. I've it's got a, two rescues, Terry and God Steve. God bless you. Yeah. God bless you, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. then I've got two, uh, two dogs, two sisters. Uh, oh. They're uh, Chin Chin and Ling Ling. Oh, beautiful. Do you miss them when you're on tour? Do you get someone at home to Skype? You know what? I actually, the other day, I was, I don't know where I was, you know, uh, on tour somewhere. And I thought, oh, I miss my dogs. And I had that weird <laughs> weepy moment that pet Aww. people get. Yeah. Oh, God. I get it all the time. My cats are in London at the moment, so I get, I get oh, very goodness. weepy. I can't that's even far. look at them on Skype. So, yeah. But that's okay. 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 I, I don't go that me. far. Counsel I don't, me. I don't go. I would. The, the Skype thing with the animals. Okay. Now that's too far. <laughs> well, there is a too far. Come on, Billy Corgan. Do you do the thing where you talk to the cats through Skype? <laughs> yes. You do, don't you? Yes. Do they look? Do they just look away? And you're like, they're not listening to me. They hate. They don't care. They, yeah, right. <laughs> they really don't care. They're but don't cats. you love the cats are so honest? I do. I do. Do you wish human beings were more like that? I I think you can learn a lot. <laughs> hey, you want to hear a quick cat story? Yeah, tell me a cat story. Okay, so we uh, my my cat uh, girl cat Sammy talks a lot, like nonstop in the house, and so um, we called a, a pet psychic. Oh. And the lady said, you know, how, you know, on the telephone, how can we help you? And I said, can you tell me what the cat is saying? You know what I mean? Cause and what is the I, cat saying? I, the cat was, was, was upset. Um, the cat believes that cats are equal to humans. Mm -hmm. And so, not that we treat her badly, but she sees herself as an even member of the household. Mm -hmm. So when she doesn't have sort of equal right to the house and, and what goes on in the house or even a place at the table, she feels kind of disrespected. So she's basically complaining like, hey, I'm equal to you. Yeah. And we've started treating her more like an equal, and, and she calmed down. She's calmed down. I was going to say, how do you remedy a, an upset cat that can't tell you exactly how she feels? What have you done? You've just made her a place at the table, did you say? She'll actually come and sit at the table with, with her little head above the table. No food. <laughs> just just join the conversation. Oh, Billy Corgan, I never expected I'd be talking to you about cats. <laughs> and I, Well, I know you're a supporter of, of, of lots of animals, so, you know, that was lovely. That's made my day. <laughs> Hey, um, have a wonderful tour. We best go, but um, have a great tour. And you've got some dates tonight. Festival Hall Smashing, uh, Smashing Pumpkins are playing in Melbourne. Wednesday, the 25th of Feb at the Big Top at Luna Park in Sydney. And, of course, Soundwave Festival this weekend, Saturday in Brizzy and Sunday in Sydney. How's Soundwave going? Are you enjoying it? Yeah, the, the fans have been great. Um, it, you know, the heat's a bit much. You oh, know, yeah, it was 41 uh, degrees in Adelaide, wasn't it? Yes, I watched my mate Manson the other day, you know, uh, melting, melting in the sun, <laughs> uh, makeup melting in the sun, fog machines are blowing, you know, into, into the sunlight. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Send him our best, will you? Hey, I shall. thanks so much, Billy Corgan. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. See ya. Born down.